Hi everyone, welcome to another video. Today we're looking at parameter prediction for unseen deep architectures. And we have a special guest today, Boris Kniazev, who is the first author of this paper, actually. So this is a first, uh, I guess, for Boris and for myself uh, to review a paper in a bit of an interview style. The plan is that we go through the paper together. There's also been some reception in the public because, as you might have heard, the paper claims to be able to predict the parameters of, an, of, a, of a neural network without you having to train the neural network. At, at least, I guess, that's the Yep. The overhype <laughs> that then leads to people saying, wait a minute, that can't be true. And we'll go exactly through this. We'll look at what they've done right here. And um, yeah, Boris, welcome yep. uh, we welcome so much to the, the channel. Thank you for a great introduction. Uh, yeah, I'm very excited uh, to be here as well. <laughs> so I'm ready to take uh, any critique from you. <laughs> <laughs> so how how did this this come to be? You're at you're at the University of Guelph, and and there's I see Vector Institute, Facebook AI research, and the the GitHub is under Facebook research. Yeah. Um, how did this come to be? So this project uh, I started uh, as an intern at Facebook AI mm -hmm. uh, in su in summer 2020, so more than a year ago. And yeah. uh, all and our collaborators are from Facebook AI, so Meta AI, right? Uh, and yeah. uh, that's why we decided to keep uh, the code on the Facebook research. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Cool, excellent. And if we can, I mean, let's let's dive in um, right here. Essentially, essentially, what we've we've said so far is you have some kind of a neural network with whatever a bunch of layers and a bunch of computational nodes and you have the weights in between somehow, right? So W1, W2 yeah. weight matrices, but not only that, you have normalization, you have any kinds of things. And usually we have some data set X and we have some result Y. We train with back propagation to find the best parameters. But in your case, you went ahead and you essentially built this hyper network, uh, hyper graph network that is able to take in, if I remember correctly, the data, right? Yeah. And the architecture, like the, the structure here of the weight matrices, all of this goes in and into a neural network, which is a graph neural network, right? Yeah. And, and so some sort of a graph neural network, and we'll go into that, what exactly it is, and out comes the, these weight matrices. Uh, so, and you're able to do this without training the weight matrices ever. So, you just predict them. Yeah. So what, one correction here, uh, the network, this hyper network doesn't take data as input. It's mm -hmm. trained on specific data set, say CIFAR 10 or ImageNet. But yeah. uh, at test time, it doesn't take data as input. It only takes uh, okay. a network as input. Uh, that's why, and yeah, it cannot generalize to other data sets. Okay, so it is, you do experiments that I see here on C410 and on ImageNet. Uh, so these are two different, let's say, hyper networks that you train. You yeah. train one for C410 and you train another one for ImageNet. Well, in fact, I trained many, many uh, networks. <laughs> <laughs> sure, <laughs> sure, but, but it's not one network yeah. that is going to predict the parameters of of for any data set. No, yeah, so we, we release mm -hmm. one network for CIFAR 10 and one network for ImageNet, correct. Okay, and this, so here you say, by leveraging advances in graph neural network, we propose a hyper network that can predict performant parameters in a single forward pass. So the single forward pass, what does that refer to? It means that I feed the architecture one single time through the graph neural network, or? Yeah, so this phrase is to highlight the difference between say recurrent networks where uh, so there are some meta optimizers right uh, and they can mm. also do something similar to our work but they require yeah. like rec many iterations in our case like it's a single propagation basically through the graph yeah network. yeah and then you you get these you get these uh these parameters out which is i mean that that's that's pretty cool and then you say um on ImageNet, oh sorry, on C410, you reach a 60% accuracy, 
and on ImageNet you reach a 50% top 5 accuracy. Now these are, let's say, they're respectable numbers, they're better than random, but they're yeah. way, way below anywhere, you know, near what I could get by actually training a network. That's it. Was this your in or was this your intention or is this is it still surprising that you get these good numbers? Yeah, yeah, it's still very surprising to me and to other co authors and to many other people I guess. Uh because uh mm, it's very hard like uh, when you have a, a novel network uh, the assumption mm. is that you know you cannot uh, predict parameters for that like if you predict it will be like some garbage neuron so there, because uh, there, will, there is a complex complex interactions between neurons uh, mm -hmm. so it's very hard yeah for a novel network you, you, yeah it's very hard Th that's the assumption yeah. uh, I don't know if okay. it makes sense. <laughs> I can it's, of course it makes sense, of course, yeah. I mean, it's, it, is, it is in a way, it's, you know, the, the numbers aren't good, but they are certainly good for never having, you know, trained. Um, yeah. But there is a bit of a, because the, the hyper network has been trained on that specific data set. And maybe we'll go a little bit into uh, your, what you exactly train this on. So you introduce a new data set which is this DeepNets 1M data set, right? Yeah. Could you tell us a little bit about this? So this is the essentially the basis for learning this hyper network. Yes, yeah, so it's a data set of training and evaluation architectures. Uh, and <clears throat> it's called uh, DeepNets 1M because we have 1 million training architectures. So we predefine them and we save them so that uh, people can reproduce uh, training probably. Uh, <laughs> uh, and mm -hmm. uh, the idea uh, there is some misconception that we actually also have trained weights for those training networks but no we don't like we didn't train yeah. one million ar architectures uh, yeah so and the architectures are almost random uh, in the sense that the operations and connectivity between them are constructed in a like random way by uniformly sampling for from a specific space of architectures. Yeah. So you you define you define a space, a design space, which you call this, right? Yeah. And this design space consists of things like, you know, you can have you can have a, a convolution, or you can have an, an an ML, or sorry, you can have a linear layer, right. or you can have an attention layer, right? And then that's followed by either a batch norm or a weight norm or not no normalization at all. Right. And then that's followed by da, da 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 da, right? And then you build sort of these these combinatorical things. So one architecture would be a convolution with a weight normalization and with something else. And then also the design space includes kind of the parameters for this. So for the convolution, you could have, I don't know, th five three yeah. or one on one side like so i can have a five by five convolution that has yeah. maybe is only depth wise and not fully convolution and so on so there are all these sort of nested cartesian products yeah of this big space that you define and then essentially you could say you you fix a random seed and then you sample it out a million times Yes. Would that be a, a fair characterization so, so that you say, okay, with, with this, we sample a million times from a fixed random seed and that, so everyone has the same networks to train on. Yeah, yeah, that's a fair uh, statement. And so there were some data sets like this before to do neural architecture search specifically, but you say you've, you've extended the design space a little bit and that, so before these networks, they would include kind of, they, the design space is large enough to include sort of the modern networks, but you have, you've sort of extended that even a little bit more. Right, um, right, right. So usually those neural architecture search uh, works, they have a quite constrained design space because they mainly consider very efficient networks, like efficient net yeah. or squeeze net, yeah. mobile net, but ResNet is out of their design space because ResNet is considered a waste of resources in, 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 in the NAS community. Yeah. Uh, but uh, in our work, we are still interested in predicting like these large uh, 
uh, uh, parameters. Let's assume that you had actually trained all the weights for the million architectures, right? And you okay. train your hyper network to predict these weights. And I sample a new one, and um, then it could be fairly like someone skeptical might say, "Well, you've probably seen a very similar network um, during training, right? So you just memorize the weights from that." So there are there are two differences here, as you said. You don't actually have the trained weights of these million architectures, yeah. which I want to come back in a second. But you also have these out of distribution uh, samples. Do you want to maybe comment on what what are the out of distribution architectures for this data set? What do they look like? Right. So the in well, I fir first I, I say what is in distribution uh, to highlight the difference. Mm -hmm. So in, dist sure. in, in distribution is uh, the test set. Uh, it, is the same as the, like it uses the same generator to uh, sample mm -hmm. architectures as the training architectures. Uh, mm -hmm. So, and uh, while the architectures are still all different, they, as you said, they can be quite similar. And we actually measure yeah. that uh, in the appendix, like we have some data for that. Uh, so that's one of the reasons we uh, designed those out of distribution uh, splits. And uh, yeah, the motivation was to test uh, particular distribution shifts. For example, what happens if the networks uh, become wider, like have more channels, uh, uh, like wide ResNet instead of ResNet. Uh, for example, mm -hmm. what, what happens if we want to predict the parameters for a deeper network, say ResNet yeah. 150 instead of uh, ResNet 50, right? So there are these yeah. there are these subcategories, right? There's wide and deep, which are wider or deeper than yeah. you've seen during training, and there is also this batch norm free uh, category. Yeah. Right? So th there are various aberrations that you didn't see necessarily during training, but yeah, I think it's fair to say that the the performance of your method still comes from the fact that you know the network has been trained on. On certain things, it's just a matter of how how much does it generalize to new architectures. Yeah, yes, for sure, it was trained on all uh, like operations that are mm. uh, that are used to compose out of distribution yeah. networks, but it wasn't trained on that particular configurations like yeah. com compositions. So it's still and how yeah. how just if we jump to the results, like just an aspect of the results, how how different. Are the weights from like? Do, do you do you know what happens if you just kind of copy over weights from the most similar network in the training data set? Does this work at all, or have you uh, done any kind of you know dumb baselines to compare? Uh, I tried, but it turned out to be yeah. more difficult uh, than it seems. Okay. So you you need to come up with many different heuristics, like how to yeah copy weights if the dimensionality doesn't match. Uh, or like if the layers uh, like not exactly the same, so there is a lot of yeah. those, yeah, and it becomes basically a separate research project like, uh, to develop this uh, yeah, sure. that dump baseline. So we didn't go in, in, in detail with that. Yeah. So this is, I guess, this is the training loss. What's special about this, as you said, you don't actually have the fully trained weights of all of these network networks, but essentially. Um, what you do is you sort of back propagate through uh, training these networks, if I, if I understand this correctly. So yeah. what you have here is a, a double sum over N and M, and N here is the number of tasks. So what is a task right here? Uh, here, uh, task is, uh, so we use the terminology from meta learning, right? So, but here yeah. the task is a network. Okay, so uh, this is the, this M, M is the number of training architectures. Yeah. And N, I presume, is the data set. Or yes, it's the number of samples in a data set, like e okay. images, yeah. So we take one point, one data point, X, right, uh, XJ, right. and w what is the A right here? Architecture. That is, that is the architecture that we sample as one of the M yeah. architectures. So we take the X, we take the, the A, and this here, that's your network that you actually want to train, right? Yeah. So as you said, it does not get the training data point. It simply gets the architecture. 
and it has a set of parameters which are ultimately the parameters we want to we want exactly. to optimize right um, and the so the f here i guess that is your way of saying take this network predict the weights pass the data point through it and get the output yeah, exactly. Uh, That's a fair characterization. For, yeah. for, for a pass of images through the yeah. predicted parameters to get the predict predictions. Yeah, so yeah, F, yeah, F calls. If I were to program this, then F would call your network to get, F would instantiate A, would call your network with the architecture, would get back the weights, put that into A, and pass the data point through once. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then we simply compare it to the label, right, which we, which we have. And then I, I guess this loss right here is uh, cross entropy loss or whatever is appropriate for the data set. Yeah, yeah. So you can basically reduce this equation to equation uh, one if you, uh, yeah. if you freeze the architecture. So if, you, mm -hmm. if M uh, is equal one uh, and instead of yeah. having a hyper network you have like fixed weights uh, w uh, w uh, yeah. then it's the same objective and it's the same loss and then you learn by back propagating if I, if i see this correctly so usually what we do is we forward pass x through this thing right and then we back propagate to these weights right here but what we do is we simply continue back propagating through the weight generating function into the hyper network. Yeah, yeah exactly. And all of this is all of this is differentiable. I guess the weights are floating point numbers and the way the graph network works is all differentiable. So you can essentially back propagate it through the parameters here. So every I guess every part of the graph neural network would have weights and yeah. you can back propagate it through that. Yeah, I mean that seems reasonable enough. Oh, this connection here—that's not—that's not happening. No for, data for, to the graph network for now. Yeah. Cool. Um, this seems—it seems pretty straightforward. So now maybe we talk about what exactly the graph neural network is getting as uh, features. And when when we talk about graph neural networks, it's it's always a bit. Um, there are many flavors of graph neural networks, but I'm going to try to characterize it um, uh, briefly. So we have nodes in the graph neural network, and each node has a bunch of features initially. So each node gets a bunch of, like a vector of different features. In our case, the nodes each would refer to Oper different, yeah. Operations. different modules, right? Yeah. So this here could be this here could be the conv the convolutional uh, the convolutional layer in the first layer this then could be the batch norm that follows in the first layer yeah. and this could be the convolution in the second layer and so on so we connect the graph neural network in the same way that the architecture is connected right so so the the, the graph neural network changes from ar architecture to architecture oh uh the graph no no the graph neural network is fixed so the graph yeah. neural network itself doesn't have no uh, doesn't have nodes right the graph neural yeah. network only uh, have yeah. weights like uh, mm -hmm. c theta right and this theta are yeah. basically like uh, a matrix uh, with the number yeah. of input features and the number of output features yeah. Uh, so the, the, those weights are fixed. Uh, what is changing is the input that is represented as a graph. I see. So this here maybe we can more characterize as the input. Yes. And that goes into that goes into a let's say a standard neural network with a bunch of layers. Yeah. But the input is essentially what you call I think A, which is the it's an adjacency matrix. Yeah. So this graph would be described by an adjacency matrix matrix and for lack i don't exactly remember how you called it but let's call it f the features yeah. of each of the nodes right and these things will go into the neural network and out would come your your different uh weights for for the graph yeah yeah and yeah 
So the way graph neural, this, these graph neural networks work is each node essentially starts with a bunch of features here, right? This has a vector, this has a vector. And then you apply these functions. So every layer here would correspond to one message propagation step, yeah. if I understand this correctly, where all of the neighbors, they would sort of pass messages to each other, uh, given differentiable functions. So if we consider this node, it would sort of receive um, from all its neighbors, it would receive messages, yeah. it would compute some sort of hidden state, and then in the next iteration, it would pass that hidden state to its neighbors. Right. right. This is the basic functionality. Now, you, in your particular case, have opted for a bit of a more advanced architecture right here that more mirrors sort of the the propagation in a neural network can you talk a little bit about that maybe right so we actually we are doing almost the same as the previous work on graph hyper network so i, I wanted mm -hmm. to clarify that the training objective like equation two and uh, the uh, like graph hyper network architecture is almost the same as the previous work but yeah. uh, it, they didn't release the open source code, so we had to like uh, reinvent so, something. Yeah, <laughs> of course. Uh, but uh, so, uh, sorry. What <laughs> what was the, the question? So I'm I'm referring. <laughs> so maybe maybe before that, I wanna I wanna just for people who may not know graph neural networks, it seems like there's a lot going on. But essentially, a graph neural network boils down to just a few functions because what I've described right here, this I receive I receive the hidden states from all my neighbors and I integrate that, right? This function is in fact the same function as you know the node over here, which also receives stuff from all its neighbors and integrates that. That would be the same function with the yeah. same weights, right? It's just that the inputs are different because of course for the node here in the middle, it has different neighbors than the node here but the, the weights of that function that takes messages and integrates them, that's the same for all the nodes. And that's why yeah. graph neural networks very often surprisingly can have very little parameters and can achieve a lot of power. Um, yeah. And then, so, so all these, these steps right here, I think you've implemented them as a recurrent neural network that simply passes on. So we would do multiple rounds of these steps and then Right. The nodes would, in multiple steps, compute uh, updates and updates and updates. So even you could implement this as separate functions. You could say time step one is one function, time step two is a function, yeah. time step three is another function. But you've even chosen, or I guess previous work as well, chosen to implement this as a recurrent network. So not only are all the functions across the nodes the same, but even across the time steps, they are yeah. essentially the same because it's a recurrent neural network. So surprisingly little parameters and the advantage of it is I can pass in any graph, right? The graphs, they don't have to be the same. Yeah. They can be totally different and I can apply the same function because it's essentially vectorized across the whole graph, which is going to play into your, your batching methodology as well, I guess, once we come to that. But my question was essentially, you've, so you, you do this first iteration right here. So the first iteration is just like a regular graph neural network. And then the second iteration, sort of your, your improved version, this GHN2, yeah. it has a bunch of, it has a bunch of, um, tricks, <laughs> tricks, <laughs> tricks right here. Oh no, that's not even, that's not even that. that. I think that's already in the, in the previous version is that your message passing algorithm, if I understand correctly, isn't as straightforward as here. It's not just I get from all my neighbors, but you have two different message passing algorithms. One mimics the forward yeah. pass through the neural network and one mimics the backward pass. So in one round, I would only get messages from my dependents. Yeah. And in one round, I would get the messages from my like upstream dependees. Yeah, exactly. Is that exactly. The, so that was part of previous work as well, or? Yeah, yeah, they developed this specific uh, like version of gated graph neural network that mimics mm -hmm. this behavior uh, of uh, forward and backward propagation. And yeah. what we found though, that just one round of uh, propagation is enough. So 
uh, we only do it once forward and once backward. Yeah. We don't. Okay. Well, you, you can do it multiple times, but mm -hmm. we found it's just wastes uh, yeah resources and it, it doesn't improve our ac accuracy for some reason. So I essentially, training your hyper network exactly mirrors training a real network in that you do a forward prop and a backward prop. But yeah. what you do is you, you simply back propagate that through the weights to the actual graph neural network weights. Yeah, yeah. So in that sense, mm -hmm. yeah, it mimics uh, how the networks are trained. Like, yeah. And so now I guess what you get out then is, fr wow. sorry to come back to this again, but every node sort of keeps updating its hidden state as this progresses. And at the end, you have a hidden state for each node, which is kind of the final hidden state. And then you put that into, into a decoder-ish right. thing, this yeah. thing right here. So there, how do, you, how do you deal with the fact that, you know, sometimes a convolution has three by three by five parameters, and sometimes it has, you know, yeah. seven by seven by 10 parameters, and sometimes it's an attention network that needs query key and value. How does a single architecture produce um, different, different number well, you can reshape, right? But even, but especially different number of parameters. Yeah, so that's actually the tricky part, and uh, we uh, we didn't we, we did something very naive actually, and there is a lot of room for improvement in that uh, part. And what we did is uh, we apply this tiling strategy, and we defined the first we defined the tensor of like a fixed what we call maximum shape. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we need to predict uh, a larger uh, tensor, uh, we tile it multiple times across uh, channel dimensions as needed. So essentially, the tiling means right co copying the same tensor multiple times to mm -hmm. make it yeah full shape. And if we tile too much, then we slice it, and uh, yeah, and we slice along the all four dimensions like uh, height, width, and uh, channel mm -hmm. dimensions. So it's quite naive and uh, limits the uh, expressive capacity of the predicted yeah. parameters, but it, that's the, uh, the yeah, that's the only method we could make work like in an efficient way so far. Mm -hmm. So there's, yeah, I guess there's room for some sort of weight, weight up sampling, some, th some sort of technique where you don't have to know the number of outputs uh, before you predict those outputs, right? Yeah, yeah, like some more, uh, yeah, or recurrent networks like that would uh, predict parameters uh, as as much as you need, like uh, sort of like in this. Yeah, one at a time. Yeah, yeah, or or something like do you know these these um, nerf or or siren net, these implicit neural networks? So essentially, you give the X and Y coordinate of a picture as an input, right. and then it would simply predict that particular pixel, right? You, you could do something yeah. here where you could parameterize maybe a weight matrix from zero to one, and you could just say, you know, or not even from zero to one, but you could, you could parameterize it somehow, and you could just ask the network, give me the output at this location and at this location. Yeah, so, yeah, that's an interesting idea, actually, yeah. But okay. I guess the, the <laughs> autoregressive part might be more might be more useful because you want to somehow coordinate the weights with the other weights you've already produced. Yeah. So yeah, that's also a tricky part. So <laughs> yeah. So you, you you make some improvements right right here that you also highlight, which is uh, the, okay. The, the differentiable normalization, which um, you want to comment on on that briefly. What what's new here? Uh, so in the original graph hypernetworks, uh, they predict parameters and they use them. They use those predicted parameters parameters directly in the forward pass. Mm -hmm. And during training, we found that they start to explode, like uh, similar to uh, I guess mm -hmm. uh, other kinds of uh, training. Uh, and uh, so yeah, predicted parameters really become uh, huge uh, and. Uh, what we found useful is to normalize them so mm -hmm. such that this uh, normalization is similar to the initialization method that people typically used. Yeah. Mm, 
so that yeah the scale of the predicted weights like the range of values is approximately yeah. uh, the same as uh, in the randomly initialized networks so there's like yeah i mean this yeah yeah this this here this this looks a lot like sort of the the formulas for take incoming and outgoing number of 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 unit of units and and normalize by that you even use here the fan in and fan out and i think these are these are terms people recognize from initializations which i guess yeah this it, it makes it makes sense at least as sort of intuitively and then this is what i this is here what i found um one of the interesting parts is these virtual edges that you introduce so we said that these um Arc, these graphs that you build, they mirror the, fo the, the neural networks. Essentially, they represent the architectures of the neural networks, specifically right. the computation graphs. And you have some examples right here. Now, they're a bit small, but this could be, this is, I guess, something like a convolutional neural network with a residual yeah. connection, is the, the, the left one, right? Because essentially, the, the blue here are conf modules, and you can see these conv modules, like here is one, here is one, and then you can also see there's kind of different paths, and yeah. then there's always normalizations and so on. So these are conv nets with residual connections yeah. as a computational, as a computational graph right here. Right. Right. Yes, yeah, something like. That. And so that you, you, you've somehow found that that is. It's not enough to build the graph like this. You can you can do better by introducing more connections between things. How did you yeah. get about this? Right. So the problem is that uh, uh, the the node propagation uh, step that we talked about like j just uh, before uh, has the problem of uh, propagating through the long uh, sequence of nodes. Yeah. So the final node, which will be usually a classification layer, will have little information about uh, features in the first, uh, in, yeah, like in the first layers, and that's a problem. Yeah, because uh, essentially, uh, graph hypernetwork doesn't know much about the overall glo global graph structure uh, mm -hmm. when making predictions. So this virtual uh, connections uh, improve like gl global context and how do you decide so you this it looks something here is a uh, an example you give from a of kind of a yeah. like an illustration illustratory graph the the computational graph in in dark and the virtual edges in green how do you decide which things to connect uh, so we use the shortest path distance uh, between nodes uh, mm -hmm. And we scale the edge, this virtual edge uh, weight, according to the inverse of this uh, shortest path dis distance. So, is at the end is everything connected to everything? Uh, we have some like cutoff uh, that we don't yeah. don't connect uh, too far nodes. Okay. But yeah. But so the, you're saying the parameters of the virtual edges here, they're shared with the parameters of or do they have their own parameters uh, own parameters uh, so there is a okay. ML, in equation four uh, yeah there is a mlp sp yeah so that's uh, like a separate network so to avoid the confusion between real edges and uh, uh, virtual okay. edges yeah i mean i guess that the, the, the edges they don't have weights themselves but you do you do make when you propagate through the graph neural network through these functions, you do make it a difference between the real edges and the in edges you introduced. Right. So in a virtual case, uh, instead of just averaging features of neighbors, it's a weighted mm -hmm. weighted average where the weight is okay. yeah, coming from the shortest path distance. Cool. Uh, I guess I, I think I find it a, a bit funny, right, that you you are. Uh, in, in the hyper network, essentially, you again run into the problem, well, what if our network is too deep? Which is essentially the, the same problem that ResNets had yeah. before. Res and then your, your solution is also, hey, let's introduce like residual connections between things so that information can flow further. It's, it's kind of funny to see that sort of the, the, yeah. the problems repeat one level up. And then, of course, the it's a, it's a different thing than a residual edge in a in a network because this isn't the network this is the input to the network but it's uh it's kind of analogous right to 
a residual connection. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And that's, uh, that was our, our motivation, <laughs> basically. Yeah. And then the, the last thing is this meta batching, um, which do you want to maybe talk about this a little? I understood this as you essentially, what, what's the difference between this and, and um, mini batching? Uh, so mini batching, uh, well, uh, usually we refer to a batch of images, right? So we, we for each yes. training iteration, we sample a mini batch, say, of uh, 64 images. But yeah. uh, uh, in the baseline GHM, they sample a single architecture uh, for each training iteration. So it's a single architecture mm -hmm. and f 64 images. Uh, yeah. Now the gradient becomes very noisy because for each architecture, the uh, the gradients are quite different. Yes. And to improve that, uh, like st uh, stability of convergence, uh, we sample a batch of uh, architectures. Of architectures yeah. and a batch of images. Yeah. Yeah. Or okay. So and then you, do you do? Is it? Do you do X1 architecture one, X2 architecture two, or do you sort of build X1, do you build up a matrix and then pass each image through each of the architectures in, in the batch? Uh, no, we uh, just do the first option. Yeah, just yeah. Run, okay. run, run so you just sample. sample a bunch of, I guess the, the analogous would be if I train a regular neural network, uh, the analogy would be, I, you know, if I just always sample from one class, because, for example, in ImageNet, the data set is structured into these folders, right? And every folder has one class. Yeah. If I want to make my life easy, I just go, you know, I do LS <laughs> of the data set, and then I just go through it, and then I always sample from one class. That would give me a very bad gradient, because in the same batch, I always have examples from the, from the same class. And here you're saying the problem was that people in the same batch, they always had the exact same architecture, yeah. And you get a much, much better um, estimate, I guess, of the gradient if these are sampled at random. Uh, it makes, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Cool. And yeah, so that's, uh, that's where we get to the, to the experiment. I think the, the um, experiments, the, the main things we've already sort of taken away in that, this is on, um, on C410 right here. Uh, you have the test set um, sort of you, you always split into average and and max uh, which is sort of performance is that that's test set performance right it's a test images and test architectures and the max test images yeah. and test architectures <laughs> from and the max is the max is over what exactly over architecture so it's like uh, the best uh, what what what's the yeah. performance of the best architecture that, yeah okay actually. i i guess that's a fair a fair metric to look at because you know each architecture if you were to train it doesn't have the same performance yeah, at the course. end right so with with the max you can expect that um, the max uh, would be an architecture that, if you trained it, had sort of the, the state-of-the-art performance of w at least the networks you consider, the architectures you consider. So maybe for CIFAR 10, that might be 96-ish percent, 97. Yeah. And yeah, okay, we, so you get some... Yeah, sorry. Yeah, we, we compare it to SGD uh, below, right? Uh, yeah. And you have a similar sort of phenomena yeah. that you have average performance and you have like the best performance that is a bit uh, yeah. higher. Okay. So that's, yeah, 90, I see that 90, 93 for 50 epochs of, I guess the state of the art things, they are reached with a bunch more tricks like, uh, yeah. like uh, augmentation, uh, more epochs. Augmentation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I see. Yeah. Okay. But I mean, there, there is a considerable gap, but it's, st it's still pretty cool to see, right. That you get, especially um, also the improvements that you make in within this parameter prediction regime uh, with these new models are quite considerable. And so if I consider, for example, from this or this, which are 60 to 77, which is sort of like 80, and then that's like almost half, half the way. of the error, right, yeah. that you make compared to state of the art. That's pretty good and even on the 
out of distribution, it seems the effect is even more um, drastic, right? right? So do you do you have any idea in to why why on a on the out of distribution set your performance it drops, but it doesn't drop too much, whereas the other methods performances they drop much more. Right. So I think. Uh like those three tricks uh, play a different role in each uh, out of distribution split. For example, yeah. in the wide case, I think what helps, uh, and we have those ablations in the appendix, it, w what helps is parameter normalization because when you have like a lot of uh, weights, then it's important like, yeah. that they are appropriate scale. And uh, in case of for deeper architectures, I guess it, what's important is, is to capture this global context because, yeah, the uh, network is, yeah, ha has a lot of nodes. Yeah. And si similar, like, for other uh, splits, uh, yeah, so I, well, for, for other splits, maybe it's less intuitive what exactly, uh, like, e mm -hmm. what single component makes it work, but I guess some interplay between, like, all those three tricks help. Nice. Yeah. And so, and then at the end, you say, um, so you have a you have a lot of ablations, which is is really cool to to see and open source code and and everything uh, that that is I think a lot very appreciated, especially on a more exotic task like this one. Um, mm -hmm. You also are able to predict some properties, like you know what's the accuracy of the network and so on, where you make sure that your network really learns some kind of intrinsic properties, right, of the, of the networks you're predicting. So the network's not only able to predict the weights, but it's also able to say, you know, what's, the, what's going to be the inference speed of the network, what's going to be the approximate accuracy on, that yeah. it's going to have, and so on, which really makes sure, or it's at least a bit of a, a, bit of, of a confirmation that you're doing something um, meaningful instead of just copying over weights. So this would be to counter anyone that says, well, you're just kind of copying over from the training set. And then the last right. thing is you then also experiment fine tuning, um, fine tuning the predicted parameters. Now, obviously in, in this regime, we're kind of like meta learning, right? We are learning a good initialization and from that initialization, I can then fine tune. Uh, but yeah. then, so my, my question is, how much time does that save me? If I use your network to predict the initial parameters of a ResNet 50, how much less time do I have to invest into fine-tuning it so if, should, as yeah. compared, to, compared to training it from the beginning? So we actually provide uh, speeds in the table, and you can see uh, yeah. the difference of like, time. You, you, you need so it's not as much as uh, you want maybe <laughs> uh, yeah. so uh, uh, as you see we uh, like uh, predict parameters is like in less than a second but you can achieve the same result by mm, pre-training on ImageNet for like half an hour or one hour yeah mm, sometimes more like on transformers yeah uh, it takes more time to achieve the same performance. So, yeah. would you say it's it's uh, it's kind of would you say your work is maybe shows that something like this can be done, or do you do you think we'll get to a place where we can make so much savings um, because we only have to fine tune for like a tiny bit that people say yes, I'm really going to use this instead of training from the beginning, or do you think? It might be mostly an academic exercise. No, I think we can arrive at that. Uh, if you can see, if we pre-train mm -hmm. for just five epochs uh, yeah. on ImageNet, then we al almost get the same performance as we train for 100 epochs or like 200 epochs. Uh, yeah. Or like slightly worse. Uh, yeah. And uh, my hope is that if we are able to predict parameters that are similar to five epochs, then we are done. Uh, with, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. It, it, now, it's difficult. So the, the <laughs> I'm not saying that of this course. is easy, but I, I'm saying that the, it's, we we don't need to predict the, the performance of a 100 uh, epoch network. Yeah, yeah. I see. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it makes it makes sense. It it, it would save uh, like it saves like a bunch of time. 
and and resources and everything and potentially allows us to investigate new and better architectures much faster uh, rather than and especially if we scale to larger models like if this holds also for gpt style models especially if it generalizes to way larger um architectures right it might even be that we're at a point where we we get such a large model that it's prohibitive to train it from the beginning but we might be able to predict and then fine tune so so, so technically like implementation wise our yeah. using our model we can't predict the model we, we can't predict yeah. parameters we sorry we can't predict parameters for a network with trillion parameters yeah sure because yeah, we, yeah. because <laughs> we use this tiling right so we can predict exactly, trillion yeah. parameters but of course it will be very yeah. bad <laughs> It may be difficult to fine tune as well. And so the, the last thing I want to get into is sort of the reception. Now, you have said previously to me that it has been kind of maybe received a bit um, out of context or, you know, a bit oversold. What, yeah. do, you, what do you mean by this? I think uh, maybe people got an impression that we can predict uh, parameters for a new task, like for yeah. unseen tasks, uh, which is not true. Yeah. We, and, yeah. and uh, even though I mentioned that we only make a single, like a small step towards replacing SGD, I think people misread it and, and <laughs> understood it like, oh, we replay, we are ready to replace. No, we are not there yet. <laughs> it's far, far, uh, far away from that. Yeah. The, the thumb, you can see the video thumbnail going something like um, SGD not needed anymore predict parameters for any neural network we are done that that that's the title <laughs> okay. I, I was trying to uh, convince <laughs> my co-authors <laughs> <laughs> i mean it's a good vision it's a good it's a nice vision to have right um but yeah it's important to point out you do generalize very well to unseen architectures but it's always within the same task now i guess the hope for the future, maybe you're already working on this or, or not, uh, would also be to investigate generalization across data sets. Maybe you can imagine a situation where you have your system on ImageNet, but then you, um, so you've trained it for ImageNet, and then you maybe give it a little bit of the data set of a new task, and it's, it's able to adapt really quickly to that or something like this, right? So it would yeah. already be quite useful i think right and there are already works that actually do that like in the meta learning uh, sense but yeah they, normally they don't generalize well across architectures so they generalize well across tasks that's their focus yes. but not across architecture so there should be a way to combine those two yeah sounds exciting all right i think um this is a is a really neat overview mm -hmm. over the paper um We'll end it here. Boris, thank you so much for, for coming here. And yeah, good, good luck on your future research. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. It was very fun uh, to, to go through the paper. Uh, so yeah, I'm very happy. <laughs> Thanks a lot.